a pleasure and it's an honor to be invited. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to go anywhere near a molecule. I managed to get through medical school, assuming that ATP and ATM were the same thing. So I'm <laughs> going to stick to an area of interest that I have, um, which uh, sort of has essentially is the, is the foundation of my interest in, in dermatology. Um, and it is, of course, the largest organ. And as such, um, it is the best studied organ uh, from the point of view of clinical um, uh, medicine. Uh, we have had for centuries the only sort of uh, diagnostic necessities has been people's eyes and the history of the patient uh, and then with the advent of histology. So if you take a specialty like cardiology for example, they have 12 common conditions that they see every day. Dermatology has 200 and there are a couple of thousand uh, endocrinology conditions. There are over 2 million dermatology conditions. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have such a long history of um, clinical observation uh, and of the ability to, to diagnose based purely on what uh, you see and what you feel and what, what you touch. Um, and so the, the skin uh, and dermatology is probably the most successful part of, of uh, medicine because we have so many treatments available and so well diagnosed. And if you extrapolate that to every other organ in the body, you'd think there must be the same number of diseases and subsets of diseases in every other organ of the body, but we just don't have the ability to study that yet. And genetics um, and biochemistry are allowing us to actually discover now that it's a slight alteration in an enzyme um, uh, that's causing the problem. So how did we get to where we're going? And this is really talking to talking to about the anthropology of skin so you have an understanding of why we have the skin we have and why it was the most important um, organ um, in the evolution of man. Uh, and similarly, it is the most important organ uh, in maintaining us um, uh, as, uh, as sentient beings. Uh, this is a picture of Richard Leakey. Those of you who have uh, any interest in, in anthropology know Richard Leakey was one of the, is, one, is one of the great um, anthropologists. Uh, and he discovered a large number of um, early um, arthropods in East Africa. I actually grew up in, uh, in Kenya. Do you need me to speak louder? Um, I grew up in uh, Kenya uh, and I spent a large uh, proportion of my childhood there. Um, so this is how we tend to see, uh, or it's portrayed, um, uh, that how, how we came across, we suddenly appeared um, hairless, pale, um, European, of course, um, and uh, a male and a female. Uh, but the reality is, I discovered when I was eight, this is a picture of us on a, in safari um, in Kenya, uh, and this, uh, again, a picture of the reason why we developed the way we developed is because this is an open savanna land. And around that campfire um, are two of the great figures of anthropology. And um, this one you'll all know, she's uh, famous for her research into chimpanzee behavior, um, and Richard Leakey. So around, around this campfire, I remember listening as an eight-year-old um, an argument about, you know, how did man get from chimp to humanity? Um, and uh, it was uh, the wife of Richard Leakey um, who was there who said she, f she thought it was the skin. The skin was probably the reason. It wasn't the brain. Everyone was saying it was the brain and it was the skin. And many years later, I came across an amazing woman uh, who is in um, <coughs> a university in the west coast of uh, America uh, and she has developed uh, an interest in uh, dermatological anthropology and being able to trace how we have and why we have developed to how we're going to develop. Uh, right, so first of all, as I said, we, it is the largest organ. Um, underneath that skin, everything pretty much looks the same, but every single one of us is slightly different, even down to the slight tonal difference in our skin type. Uh, we are all a slightly different color in this room. That's, you know, there's something just just about our recipe, which makes us slightly difficult. So what does your skin do? Well, um, it's a protection. It was uh, initially developed uh, as a single cell to protect us against the outside. Um, our skin doesn't rust, however. It doesn't bend. It doesn't break. And if it does, it heals itself. It protects us in microscopic level as well. Uh, you know, we're constantly uh, in a world which is trying to assail us, and it has to try and prevent anything getting in and prevent anything getting out. Uh, as well. It's also our climate control system and this is probably one of its most important aspects, uh, particularly in anthropology. 
uh, and it protects us from uh, our sun, which we need, uh, but it also protects us from the uh, unnecessary radiation that we get. We also have to have the ability to find touch. We need to be able to, to, to touch things. We need to know when something is dangerous. We need to know and have that ability to hold a, 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 a rose and not let a fine uh, thorn pick us. So we have absolute exquisite sense of touch, an exquisite sense of pressure. Um, and this is, again, a sort of complex structure. We also use it as our interface in society. We all know how we look, we all know how we, we touch each other and how touch changes throughout time and in fact your relationship with some person right up to the level of intimacy that you may have with someone. It's through your skin and it's through touch and it's through how you see them and view them. It's also our signal um, in society about what we want um, people to perceive us as. Um, so we have been designed essentially to be, uh, to be, uh, to be again, like everything in life, it's down to sex. Uh, designed to be attractive and that is for procreation um, and our skin and the way that we react and the way that we age and the way that we change allows us um, to, to send those signals out so for example this is a beautiful young woman how do we know she's beautiful well we can see it because it's hardwired into our brains but why is she beautiful she's beautiful because she's symmetrical all right so one half of the body and the face looks like the other half and what does that suggest if you're symmetrical and for men and women it's slightly different the facial shapes that we want, the facial features that we want, that make somebody attractive. But there is a scientific formula, and we follow that as dermatologists if you're doing cosmetics. Uh, and that is the depth of the brows, the depth of the temple compared to the eyes, the length of the jaw. All of these are, are done to sort of an ideal. Um, but it's symmetry is what we look for. And what does symmetry suggest? Good genes and good nutrition. So a beautiful person is symmetrical. And we, that is everything we do in our life is to try and remain symmetrical. Um, uh, so that we are attractive uh, for procreation. It's also a way, our skin is a way to us to uh, send out messages to people, to actually allow them to see what we uh, suggest or what we're trying to make them understand. And this is an obvious example of um, tattooing, which occurs in all um, societies of all ages, uh, to send a message. And this is one of, of aggression, for example. And when that system is altered or changed, just we've lost one. Well, there's one, one that system is, is altered or changed, you'll see that actually it's, it's, you, you disbelieve somebody. So for example, if you have somebody who's had a bad cosmetic job, um, you instinctively distrust them. Uh, and that is because you're reading their face. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and, and, the, and, and how important it is to appear natural as opposed to unnatural because our face is our major um, uh, communication tool. So this is really where we started and I suppose how did we end up to this? Um, you know when we get to the, 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 the top of the feeding chain if you like and it is all down to our skin. Skin is highly complex. Uh, we know that for example it's a barrier. It's a barrier to anything going out and coming in uh, and that's why for example I use the words the skin does not eat or drink. <coughs> right? it does not eat or drink so whatever you put on your skin stays on the skin. If it gets into the skin and into the body, it's a pharmaceutical substance, all right? So 123, 140, uh, 200, 300, 400 euro creams are exactly the same as Vaseline. <laughs> Vaseline's not as nice and doesn't come as nice a package, but that is how it works. If it actually enters into the skin, it has to be classified, so it has to be prescribed. Um, so always remember that when you're buying things. The rest of it is all about making you feel good. And there are some things like vitamin C, etc., that have some effect, but only on the epidermis, the dead part of the skin. We have our sweat glands, uh, again, vitally important for us. We have uh, all our, our sensory glands, uh, and then we have our eccrine glands, which are, again, a hangover from our, our, our anthropological ancestors, and these send signals um, about, uh, to again, our unconscious brain, about uh, whereabouts in our cycle we may be, or whereabouts in our ability to reproduce we can, we can be. And any of these can go wrong. Any of these tiny little systems can all go wrong. You can have inflammation, you can have vascular chan problems, you can have um, blockages, you can have inflammation of, of hair follicles with, with or without scarring. So any of these can, can go, go wrong. And of course we have our melanocytes, and our melanocytes are our um, pigment cells. So the skin initially started, and that was just as this is a single cell, and this is, so initially it was just to keep the water out. And so it started to, that's how it developed. Um, and then evolution decided it was actually much better to clump these together, and some of these would specialize into staying around the edges. And you can see this even in multi, 
uh, in multicellular organisms, you have a little bit of, of, of specialization. So the skin is the first thing to begin to, to develop, or at least an, uh, an, an ectoderm of some sort is the first thing that is beginning to develop uh, as we progress through the system. Of course, then when we leave the water and go onto dry land, it has to change. Why? Because we have to maintain uh, the amount of hydration uh, for our, our, our body systems. So the skin had to change first to allow us to get out of the water and onto the land. And the way it did that, essentially, and um, what's visible today are things like um, scales, etc. So the amphibia then came, came on, uh, on stream. The problem with amphibian skin is it doesn't reproduce. Okay? It won't grow. It won't stretch. It's solid. It's like that suit of armor. So what do they do? They regrow them, a complete new set of skin underneath it, and so scale. Birds, their feathers, they are just um, increased hair shafts. Uh, they're the same, same uh, uh, base as a hair. And again, they have to be able to, if you lose a feather, you have to grow another one. Um, so it's not something that, uh, that is static, it's something that's constantly changing. And that's our main difference, uh, is our ability, our skin's ability to constantly repair itself. And so this is a uh, epidermis and, uh, uh, and, and dermis, uh, and if you look at um, the skin here, let's see, I, they, they don't, uh, these are these little brown bits here are, is your melanin, all right, so that's your melanin that's being produced your by, by your melanocytes, and what's most noticeable about it, it's sitting on top of the nucleus, all right, so it's actually protecting your nucleus, and that's how melanin works, it absorbs the UV radiation. I often think it's like a little sun hat over your cellular nucleus trying to protect it and absorb the, 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 um, uh, the radiation. You can see the skin is constantly changing and constantly growing uh, and that's built into it. And we have basal keratinocytes which form the par part of the skin and then squamous cells, etc. And they're all re reproducing. We don't really know from what. There's probably mother cells somewhere in the skin, but it isn't actually being clarified to any great extent. And what happens when this goes wrong? What happens when this barrier goes wrong? Well, on the far picture, the Velcro that is holding your epidermis onto your dermis, there's one small genetic defect. You can get epidermolysis bellosa dystrophica. You cannot keep your skin on. So the slightest little, and you may have heard this is butterfly children. Um, and this, uh, this uh, essentially, they're unable to keep their epidermis onto the dermis. And this can be uh, life-threatening, certainly very crippling. And this is a much more common condition, eczema. All right? So what happens in the, in the actual epidermal and dermal um, uh, sort of components of the skin. Well, we know, for example, that some of them are missing or altered or abnormal, and that alters the actual um, the, 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 the cell barrier, if you like, or the skin barrier. It changes it so that it is less able to keep on to uh, its um, moistures. And, and that's, there's a whole range of lipids and cholesterols and, and um, uh, organisms which are, which are vital to keep that skin um, watertight and to keep it permeable correctly. Um, and if one or two of those are altered, and uh, we're beginning to discover that now in eczema, that changes the skin barrier. And what happens if you change the skin barrier? Well, things can get in and get out a lot more easily. So, for example, that's why if you have eczema, we talk about moisturizing, 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 moisturizing. And then we talk about everything else. Because there's no use you putting on a cream if your skin is dry, thick, and it's not going to absorb things. Also, that's why we would tell people with eczema, for example, you have to be aware that you're at an increased risk of developing allergies. And that's because of contact. You're constantly in contact with things. We advise our eczema patients not to become hairdressers, for example, not to, become, uh, not to work in areas where they're going to be constantly exposed to, to allergens. And of course, there's the usual thing, you know, it's due to diet. In the vast majority of people who have eczema, it is not a diet-related uh, condition. It's actually to do with the skin barrier. Uh, and then when, you've, when something else goes wrong, so for example, psoriasis here, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the turnover rate of the skin uh, is, is altered. It drops from about three months to less than a few days. So the skin is turning over a lot more quickly, and that's all reduced now, we, we know, down to inflammation. The skin is turning over and turning over much faster. You've got massive amount of inflammation, etc. And what's really interesting is that psoriasis now is not seen as a skin disease, but as a systemic disease. Because if you have severe uh, psoriasis, you're more likely to have cardiac disease, you're more likely to have um, uh, other, other inflammatory disorders, uh, you're more likely to develop diabetes because of that massive amount of persistent inflammation. Um, so psoriasis is a systemic disease, but it's just uh, uh, on the skin. We've known for years about the, the psoriatic arthritis. Um, so there's a link between all of the, the organs and the skin. And then, for example, um, 
uh, ectodermal dysplasia. Uh, this is where, for example, part of the, the, uh, the skin is, is, is abnormal due to a genetic defect, but also you get abnormalities in the hair shaft and sweating and teeth, etc., etc. So again, a genetic abnormality. And this is, for example, with your eccrine glands, those, those glands or apocrine glands that give off that um, sort of um, like pungent uh, furnome, and they're predominantly in the axillae and in the groin. And this is a condition called hydrodynitis suppurativa, where you just get these massive amounts of inflammation and um, uh, cyst formation and scarring, and it can be very destructive. Uh, we don't know the cause of that, but we do, again, know it's uh, inflammatory. And it's probably because of the way that the eccrine gland handles the bugs that's on our skin. So there's something a little wrong with that. So let's go back to our neighbors. Um, and let's, how, how, did we, how did we get to where we are? Well, it was essentially because of climate change. Climate change got rid of a lot of the dense jungle within Africa. And Africa is the heart of, of mankind. It's the motherland of mankind, if you like. There's a wonderful book called Eve, if you ever want to, uh, if you want to read it. Uh, it's about how uh, we developed. And we were able to, to, to uh, essentially track down uh, the genetic uh, marker, markers of man back to one female in the middle of Africa, they, they feel. Um, so that climate change got rid of, uh, for some reason or other, got rid of the, the, the dense jungle and this appeared, the savanna. And as a result, to be able to travel long distances and to be able to see over and to see long distances so that you were safe, we had to get up off our old fours and start to walk. And we became bipedal. But what happens when you become bipedal? You change the way that you're uh, you're, you're, losing, you're losing and generating heat. You also are now out in the sun, and so you're gaining heat, you're under, uh, you're under heat. Um, so you need to be able to control your core body temperature. So this is the classic thing, here's man developing away, and it's his brain getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <coughs> right? His brain has always felt that that is what's made man amazing, but in fact it isn't. It's the skin, and it's one particular part of the skin that allowed us to do that, and that's sweat, all right? It was sweat that allowed us to be able to actually get up and walk across the savannah. Now, why does it do that? <clears throat> well, if you think about it, uh, you're now out of the shade of the trees and you're walking uh, and there is no uh, remit from the heat in Africa. So we stood up, and we started to walk and we had to sweat out that. Uh, we no longer panted, we had to sweat it out and so our sweat glands developed. We began to lose our hair as a result, uh, again, because it's easier for you to um, uh, evaporate your sweat of hairless skin, apart from your scalp, interestingly. And that's because the hair in the scalp is slightly different, and, and African hair is slightly different than European hair. African hair is very good at holding a layer of moisture just on the scalp, so it's slightly cooler than the surrounding air, whereas European hair is not very good at doing that. So we didn't actually need, as Europeans, we don't need our hair, thankfully. Um, so the other thing to be aware of then is that our height, so this is a Maasai warrior, um, he was in fact our um, Ascari or guard uh, where, we, where we lived in Africa and everyone had one, we don't know why, it's probably to keep lions at bay, but um, he never did anything really, just walked around, it was rather scary as a, as a young, young boy. But they are tall and when you are tall, you've got a lot of surface area and if you've got a lot of surface area, you're going to lose heat a lot more frequently and that allowed us and our brain to begin to develop because the brain needs to be kept at a constant cool temperature. So by, by being able to do that and being able to sweat and lose in those peripheries, uh, that allowed us to, 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 and you can see this, the thermogram of you know, trying to keep that brain really cool, blue is cool, and trying to keep it really cool and your core temperature high enough. And of course, the problem was that that was in Africa, when it was hot in Africa, but as humanity began to move, and humanity moved out of Africa, and moved along the coasts, um, all over the land bridges into Asia and then into Europe, um, uh, going so north uh, and, and east, and then finally they went fully east and coming back into this part of the, uh, part of the world. Um, and so just remember that history that we went that way and then came all the way around again, uh, because the colour of the skin varies depending on where you are. You can see we have a whole range of pigmentations available to us um, as humans. Uh, and why do we have this? Why aren't we all the same colour? And it's essentially down to a war between these two things. All right, one of these is folate, I think it's the top one. And one of these is vitamin D, the bottom one, I think. It could be the other way around. You'll know more better than I would. So, what do we need vitamin D for? We need vitamin D for our bones. And what do we need good bones for? A good pelvis. And what do we need a good pelvis for? Childbearing, all right? 
So you needed to be able to make vitamin D early on in your life when you're forming your pelvis. Not so much in, uh, in men, but to a huge extent in women. Men needed it to be able to grow and hunt, etc. But you also need folate. You need folate for neural tube, <coughs> neural tube development. The problem is folate is broken down by sun exposure on the skin. All right? So what we needed to do was get a way where we could get enough vitamin D so that we could develop a pelvis, and, but also protect our folate so that we could have healthy children that were going to survive. And that's where pigmentation came in. This lady is from Central Africa. She's very dark. She's in a, an area of the world where there's a large amount of UVB radiation, which is persistent. So she's going to get enough UV radiation to make her vitamin D from her skin, but also diet to some extent. But skin w w was, was the pro predominant, early on, the predominant form of vitamin D ingestion. Whereas this lady is from the northern hemisphere. There wasn't an awful lot of UVB radiation. Um, and as a result, she needed to get as, allow as much um, UV radiation, UVB predominantly, into the skin to make her vitamin D. So she had to become pale so that she could do that. And this happened because of, a, uh, again, a genetic um, uh, alteration. And there were three geographic areas in the world where three separate um, uh, alterations in the melanin gene occurred. So if we look, this is a zebrafish. Um, the top zebrafish um, has this brown-black pigment called eumelanin. It's one form of melanin. The bottom um, zebrafish has this reddish-brown pigment called pheomelanin. All right? So the eumelanin is really good at protecting you against UVB. So it's dark and it's black and it's brown. Whereas the reddish brown one is not particularly good at protecting you from UVB. All right? And all of us are a mixture of pheo or eumelanin. The redheads among us have more pheomelanin and the darker among us have more eumelanin. But we all have our own little recipe of, of, of melanin. And that is what protects us and gives us sufficient to allow us. And of course, as, you, as we moved north into the northern hemisphere, we needed to get paler and paler and paler. And over the generations, the paler you become, the more likely you were to be, to be um, successful in procreation, so more of you survived, etc. And we became paler and paler as we went north into the European um, subcontinent. And so this is a, a map of pigment around the world and the color of skin, etc. And you can see, again, it's predominantly Africa uh, and Asia, the, the darker skin types. And that's because, as we said, we moved east as we moved out of Africa, over the land bridges, across here, down to there, and over here. Now, one of the, the uh, um, melanin um, mutations occurred here, another here, and another in Europe. So those were the... the uh, and it's obviously, this was really good for survival because there were three, and you know it's 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 throughout the world, uh, and it has survived. So it was really necessary, um, and selected out. But why isn't this area dark? That was one of the questions we were wondering. Why aren't people who live around the equator in this part of the world dark? Why? Because they migrated later. So by the time they crossed into this, these two continents, we knew about clothes, or bear skins, or whatever they were. They, they, but we could cover up. So we didn't actually need to protect our skin because we could cover up. And also our diet had altered. We were now eating a lot more uh, meat and a lot more fish. And so, for example, if you look at the people who live in the, the most northerly part, uh, the um, Inuit, the Inuit are brown because they get almost all of their vitamin D from their diet. They don't need to be pale because they eat so much fish. Um, so that's the reason why they are darker. Um, whereas we didn't have a high fish diet, and so we needed a little bit of vitamin D from our, from our, our skin. And so how did that select out from our point of view? Well, in the top picture is a man and woman are getting married, and again, so we have ethnic differences. And pale is seen as very beautiful in the dark-skinned races. It's only the mad Europeans who think tanned is beautiful. And why is pale beautiful? And why is pale woman more attractive? and a slightly darker man more attractive. For example, if you look at these twins down below, they've had exactly the same life. They have exactly the same eye color, exactly the same hair color, but she's paler. And the reason for that is because it was, it's genetically hardwired into us that if she's pale, she's a good pelvis. All right? Where the men are slightly darker because they've got to a stage where they 
develop their bones and they're able to walk, etc., and they're survived, but now they have to produce sperm. So they have to protect their folate, so they're slightly darker. And we maintain, we do get darker uh, in, our high in our high productivity years. And in fact, it's interesting that you tan your best in your teens. After that, your melanocytes don't, they start to sort of produce less and less and less. We fade as we get older, essentially. So you're more likely to burn as you get older, whereas you tan much better as a teenager. And that's because it's thinking procreation. That's what, you know, sex, 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 uh, as always. So of course, what does, how does this impact on us? Well, if you ask anybody, what's the first thing they think about? Lovely complexion. That's what they want. They want a lovely complexion. They want freckle-free, they want mark-free, because that is showing that you're young. All right, so all of those facial peels, lasers, resurfacing, all of, it's all about making you look younger because it's giving you a nice, even pigmentation. If you go to countries in the Far East, altered pigmentation is a dreadful thing. It's seen as really bad. I spent uh, uh, time in Korea and I was amazed that there were women going around with gloves on their hands, full, like they were almost in perda, and it was to maintain that flawless complexion. And the rest of us were all sprawled on the beach trying to get darker and more freckly. Um, so that's hardwired into our brains. And that's exactly the same reason why, as you get older, women want to go blonder. They want to they get their hair gets blonder and blonder and blonder, S synthetically, not naturally, because blonde hair is seen as younger looking. So what happens then when you begin to, um, to uh, become pregnant? You start to darken. So we all know that melasma that pregnant women get around their face and they get these stria nigra on their, on their, um, their uh, um, abdomen and their moles can get darker. Why is that? Because the body is now saying protect the folate. So it's getting darker to try and protect the folate. Why is it around the center of the face? Well if you look at the picture of a chimp, this is an area that has no hair. So it's probably a flashback to that part. That's why we get darker in the center of the face to become pregnant. Uh, and what's that sending a signal? Men now see, aha, uh -huh, she can have children, but she's having children by somebody else. So again, hardwired into us, is this person available or not available to us? And that's essentially the message that's going, that's going out. So this is your melanocyte. About one in every 15 cells along your basement membrane um, uh, is a melanocyte. So here's one here, for example. And they are a bit like sort of octopus. They sit between your cells with all of these arms going in between all of the cells. And when you stimulate it, stimulate a melanocyte by UV radiation, it starts packaging them in all melanosomes and packages them up and it goes and pops it over each cell. The easiest way to think about it. Um, and melanocytes do not like each other. They don't. They're not social at all. They spread out nice and flat across the epidermis. But when something goes wrong uh, with that, you know, so for example, this is a condition called vitiligo. This is where your immune system, for some reason, does not like your melanocyte and it is going to try and get rid of it. So Michael Jackson did actually have vitiligo. He had very severe vitiligo. So he took a pill, which we can, we can treat vitiligo with this, which completely depigmented him, just wiped out his melanin. So that's why he went around under umbrellas and oxygen masks, because he had no ability to protect himself. So vitiligo is where your immune system is, is trying to destroy your melanocytes. And for years we tried to, this is a therapy with, immune, uh, with uh, immunotherapy, for uh, melanoma, because we knew the immune system could destroy your melanocytes. So we gave people interferon, we gave them interleukin, we gave them the likes of ipilimumab now, CD4 LAs. So that's one of the reasons that we, we, is important. But this is how it probably happened initially while we began, began to fade and get paler. For some reason, um, our bodies knew it needed more vitamin D. <coughs> this is when the migration, for example, of your melanocytes from your melanocytes grow in your endoderm, the same places your spine grows from and your nerves, and they migrate out towards the skin. And when they, something goes wrong in that migration towards the skin, uh, you form moles, thank you so much. You form these moles, and moles are little clumps of cells of melanocytes. We use the word nevus, which means nest. Um, so they all clump together, and we don't know why that is. Uh, we don't know what causes them to clump together, but it's so common there has to be some sort of reason that helps us uh, and this person has a condition called um, atypical nevus syndrome or dysplastic nevus syndrome. They have hundreds of moles. They have lots of abnormal looking moles and they're at an increased risk of melanoma. It makes pretty much sense. You've got a lot of moles means you have a lot more melanocytes than somebody who has no moles. We all have the same number of melanocytes protecting us. But when they clump together again, you're getting more and more of them. It's also why you can get melanoma in areas that the sun never shines, such as your brain or your spine or your bowel. 
because you have melanocytes in those areas too, because they will, they will, do, they will uh, migrate to there. Really important part of our skin, of course, is touch. We need to have the ability um, to sense. And there is a whole range of organelles which have been used, um, which can do very fine sense of touch, um, it, vibration, temperature, etc. And we're able to feed that into our brain. And again, it comes from um, previously, uh, you know, the, the cat will use its, its whiskers. That's the most sensitive. For a bat, for example, the hairs on the underside of the wing will tell the bat how fast that air is moving. So there's a huge amount of sensory information going into the brain. And in humanity, this is how we see our skin, all right? So you might want to know what the three erogenous zones are. They're fairly obvious. Um, but that is how we actually sense, all right? So this is how our brain sees our senses, and that's why certain areas are more important. So hands, feet, lips. Um, and face are all very important in our sensory input. And why is the mouth so important? And if you think about it, we have to eat. So and you will be able to taste and, 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 and touch and be able to tell whether fruit was ripe or not from your mouth and your lips. So again, evolution plugging us in so that we, we are uh, suggested. The other thing then is our fingerprints. We'll talk about this. This is the start of our fingerprints. They began to lose the hair or the tail so they could hang on to things. You'd sweat into the, into the areas, and by forming a little gentle amount of uh, thin layer of sweat uh, or of dampness, you're able to hold on to things. You know that. You can, you know, if your hands are really dry, you know, nothing will stick, whereas if it's, if it's slightly wet, if it's too wet, of course, is the problem. And then so we have our fingerprints developed. And you have in every single little one of these, every single little one of these little dots is a sweat gland opening onto your skin, so you're getting a little bit of sweat. And this is again individual to each one of us, an amazing evolutionary um, feat. And that's why we did that. And again, it was for feeding. We needed to be able to feel, we needed to be able to know whether something was ripe, not ripe, edible, not edible. So we needed to do it with our, with our fingers, with, our, um, with our, 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 our mouth and our tongue. We needed our feet to be able to sense what we were walking on, hence the reason why they are overrepresented in the brain. And when something goes wrong with our sensory perception, we get problems. So this person um, has a condition called atrophic uh, neuralgia. They had a nerve damage to this area, and it feels abnormal to them. So they're picking away at it. They don't feel it. They're picking away at it and destroying their own skin and subcutaneous tissue because they've lost that sensation to the area. And this is exactly what happens with people with diabetes, for example. They can't feel the bottom of their feet. So they, this is totally painless for this person. They just don't know when they're burning. They don't know when they're wearing out their, their, their skin. We'll stop walking. We've developed this. but diabetics can't. It's exactly the same with leprosy as well, um, it's those sense. And then from our psychological development, this is incredibly important. We need to have interaction, particularly close interaction with other uh, human beings. And um, these are particularly cruel um, uh, set of experiments that was done on, 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 on baby monkeys. And they had um, mother monkey, which gave them a lot of food, but it was cold and it wasn't warm and it wasn't cuddly. And then there was this, which was warm and soft. And the baby monkeys stayed with this one, but only went to the feeding mother when they needed to go. So food was the secondary most important thing for the baby. So they needed protection uh, and intimate. So again, hired wired into our brain to seek that when we're, when we're young. We want, we want that sense of, of um, social, social interaction. And all um, forms of society have a social interaction. This is grooming, which occurs on all, all, in all primates. Uh, and, and it's a way that we build bonds with people uh, within our society. Um, and even as doctors or scientists, very important. We never forget the importance of touch. And my, the first um, uh, a dermatologist I ever did, uh, ever worked with, used to sit on the edge of the bed and hold the, patient during, hold the patient's hand during a ward round. And the sisters would be at, screaming at him to get off the bed to count the infection risk, infection risk. And he absolutely refused to because he felt that sitting down and being close to the person and holding them was so important. Um, and I still try to do that today when there isn't a matron around. <laughs> but of course, we've carried it to the complete opposite end of the spectrum now with grooming. All right, so we are now grooming, but again, grooming for a reason. Uh, but it's a huge multi-billion euro industry founded on very little evidence, one would have to say. Um, I often do the same when we're talking about melanoma. I often say there are two trials proving that some protection factor may be useful in the prevention of melanoma. And how many billions of people use some protection factor throughout the year? All right, so it's just very weak evidence, but it's sort of gone. And now we all think we'll put the sun protection factor on and we'll be fine. That's not necessarily the case. And then hair. 
we began to lose our hair. We began to lose our body hair again so that we could thermoregulate. It's fairly obvious what hair does. It makes you look bigger. All right. So if you're threatened and you, your hair rises, you look bigger. It's fairly obvious with the, with the cat and the chimpanzee. We still have the, the remnants of it now with our, with our pilo erection. We do have little hairs um, that stand up. We're not quite sure. It's usually um, now to, to trap a little, a little bit more, more air. This of no great benefit. So we had to develop a way of communicating. We did this with our faces. So when we look at people, we look at their faces and we look predominantly at the centre of their face. All right. Um, and we will look at what they are saying to us. So this gentleman is at the whole range of, of emotions. And we're reading these emotions, you know, about 30 to 70 percent of what we perceive in a, an interaction with someone is what we see, not what we, what we hear. This is fairly obvious, what he wants. And we need this evolutionary selection. We need to know danger point to get out of here. Or good person, you know, supportive mother figure, right, we'll go, to, we'll go to that. So we needed that evolutionary. And now, of course, we've got to the stage where we've lost that ability to use our facial muscle, muscles here chemically because of Botox. All right. And if you look at her, she's a beautiful woman in her, beautiful woman, and somebody has badly done her, 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 and as a result, you look at her, she strikes you as, oh, something slightly unusual. Okay, it's what we call an FLK, or a funny looking kid. Not quite sure. <laughs> But there's something slightly different and slightly wrong about that. So what do you do? You mistrust. I don't do many cosmetics. I have 13 people that I do cosmetics on, all of whom are men, um, and all of whom being with me for years. And every single one of them uh, is in business. They all have to look fresher. But the most important thing is I have to make sure their, their face moves. Because if their face doesn't move, when they're trying to sell, they can't. Because the person's automatic instinct is something wrong, don't trust. So, uh, very difficult to do men correctly. Um, and then, of course, it's fairly obvious. Um, the other reason that we, you know, we have our, our, our skin is to send those signals. Right, we're ready. Okay? Um, you know, we're ready for procreation. This is a good time to make your move. Right? And just remember that the next time you're doing it in the morning. So <laughs> that's exactly what lipstick does. Lipstick is just sending that, sending that signal. And that's why lipstick rates go up during a recession. So finally, I suppose, this is the bit underneath, all right? And it all looks the same, absolutely looks the same. One heart looks pretty much like another. One liver looks pretty much like another. Really most, uh, you know, uh, unexplored at this stage. With the skin, every single person's skin is different. And every single person's skin um, is unique. Uh, so it is the most complex organ, as I said, and I'm glad to be getting to know a little bit of it. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Patrick, thanks so much for the magnificent presentation covering so many different areas. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can't all run out to the sun. Sunscreen is really that the evidence is pretty weak. The evidence is weak, in, one, one, in a sense, but it is going to be, a, it would be, a, and that's really, again, I suppose, science, because how are you meant to, to, to do that? You know, it's a, it's, it's a 10 to 15 to 20 year lag time between sun protection and using it correctly, etc. cetera. Um, that, you know, it, it, it would be very difficult to, 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 to follow that, particularly as 20 years ago, the, UV, the sun protection we had was only for UVB. It wasn't for UVA. That's only sort of come on stream in the last 10 to 15 years. So those of us of a certain age, when we were putting on our factor three or four and thinking we were great um, because nobody else wore sun protection in those days, we have probably done a little bit more damage because we were giving ourselves UVA at huge rates and weren't burning. The skin's burning is a warning system, essentially. If you burn, you stay out of the sun. And if you burn, you don't go out for the next few days. Um, and you're very careful and, you know, for a short period of time, usually. Um, so burning can, you know, although burn will increase your risk of melanoma, burning is nature's way of telling you to get out of the sun. And we altered that initially with the sun protection factors being only UVB, because we only thought it was UVB, but in fact, we know it's UVA uh, as well as UVB. Um, and then we've got our sun protection factor types. So we've got our 
um, organic and inorganic. Some of them absorb um, and transfer the radiation energy and, tran and transform it and transfer the radiation energy, and others reflect it. So, for example, titanium and zinc oxide, um, they are the ones that cause the sun protection factor to be really white. They're, they essentially think of thousands of millions of mirrors on your face, and it's just reflecting the, the light back, and that's why you look whiter. Whereas the chemical sunscreens uh, are a lot more cosme cosmetically acceptable. The problem with the sunscreens, of course, is they deactivate. If you sweat them off, you towel them off, etc. We don't use them frequently enough, thick enough, etc. So there's very little evidence. There's some evidence, but you know, I think a good lab-based, um, good lab-based sort of uh, uh, long-term study hasn't been done um, to an extent. There's only really one from Australia, and that was that has flaws, I suppose, like any of these ones. But it's suggested uh, you prob probably would be useful. So. Would you mind to explain how melanoma occurs? God, if I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> All, okay, clinically, what do we know about melanoma? We know that y there are certain risk factors. So the, sort of the, the risk factors when we see somebody walk into a clinic is the color of their skin, um, the color of their hair, the color of their eyes, blue or green eyes, red or blonde hair. The number of moles you have, the more moles you have, usually more than 100, will put you into a risk factor. And also there's a personal history of melanoma. If you've had melanoma once, you have a 4% chance of getting another one. Or a family history of melanoma. The more members of your family that have it, the more likely you are. Mel genetic, if you like, familial melanoma is rare, less than 5% of cases. Um, but you are at an increased risk, and that's probably because of your skin phenotype. You, just, you all have the same type of skin and all the same type of sort of sun habits, etc. Um, and then I think probably the, the, the biggest problem we have is that we have classified melanoma as one disease. Now we know, for example, clinically there's five different types. Um, but even if you look at something like BRAF mutations, they are in melanoma, um, but they're also in moles. Um, and they're slightly higher rate in abnormal or dysplastic nevi than they are in normal nevi, and then a higher rate in, in melanomas. Worldwide rate of BRAF mutations, melanoma is probably about 60%. In Ireland, the BRAF mutation rate is much lower, you know, between 30 to 40%. We don't know why. Maybe it's particular Celtic thing. Um, uh, there's lots of different mutations they have found in, in melanoma, but not all melanomas. So ocular melanoma is different from acral melanoma, is different from superficial spreading. So I don't think it's one disease, and I think when time will come where we will classify melanoma on the genetic um, abnormality. So what, what, what causes it? Well, you can get melanoma without UV radiation. That's the first and most important thing. So you do get primary melanoma of the gut, primary melanoma of the bowel, primary melanoma of the brain. Even in your lymph nodes, you can have melanocytes that become um, uh, uh, neoplastic. But we know from melanoma, particularly superficial spreading and particularly nodular melanoma, that um, exposure to large amounts of radiation, particularly in childhood, but throughout any time of your life, but particularly in childhood, and um, burning or uh, blisters, blistering burns, those are high risk factors. So if you have a history of that in the past, well, which one of us doesn't have a history of a blistering burn? We're Irish, we all blister. Um, you know, most of us will, or, and it's usually accidental. Nobody goes out of their way to burn. Um, uh, so, and then probably the young uh, exposure is to do with the lag period. But I'd say it's, it's like everything, it, it really, it's, it's not one step, it's 23 different steps all have to happen. So I think we're still, we still don't really understand it. Um, and you can even look at the chemotherapy that we're getting at the moment. There's nothing specifically you know, aimed at melanoma. BRAF mutation, yes, it's useful, but on its own, only for a period of time. So for example, you can develop a melanoma. Your primary melanoma can be BRAF negative. You metastasize, and half of your metastases are BRAF positive, and the other half are BRAF negative. So you know, I don't think it's, then we're, we're decades away from finding that question. When I let you know, I'll let you know. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Great skin, by the way. The uh, very profound subject of freckles. Yes. Do they fall into the, your evolutionary pattern of certain things, uh, of you know, even tone skin yeah. being selected for, and yet yeah. it seems to be passed along with the, with it the is. hair? Yeah, it is. And again, if you think red hair and Celtic. Okay, freckles. Well, what, what is a freckle, firstly? I'm just going to dis describe. A freckle comes and goes with the sun. All right? So and most people think a freckle is a flat thing. But, uh, that's a lentigenase. All right? So freckles will eventually become lentigenase. They don't disappear. But if you look at a young child, they get freckly in the summer, and then it fades in the winter. But as you get older and older, we get more and more, and they stay. 
All right. Um, I think the easiest way I, I describe a freckle, a freckle is your skin telling you you're a crap tanner, essentially. <laughs> That's what it's saying to you. Um, but we know that because you have that type of melanin. You have that fail melanin if you are that sort of uh, freckly person. Now, there are people with you melanin who also get freckles. But essentially, it's as a result of, you know, of, of repeated radiation injury to the skin and the skin telling you I can't, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I can't pigment up correctly, so I'm pigmenting up irregularly. Um, and because each one of us has a different recipe of how much fail melanin and ewer melanin we have, your freckles will be all slightly different throughout your body as well. So that's essentially what freckles are. And freckles are also a warning sign, you know, one of the risk factors if you're freckly. Um, it's saying, okay, you're not so good at protecting yourself from the solar radiation. And the reason for that is, well, we needed you to get vitamin D. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is eczema, can be treated or not? Um, yes, it can be treated. Like most things in medicine, we're not very good at finding cures. But we can certainly treat it. Um, and there are lots of, 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 you know, there's still a lot of blunderbuss um, treatments uh, available. As I said, the most important part of uh, treating eczema is hydrating the skin. So you're constantly um, using emollients. You hear people say, oh, don't, you know, don't, ba don't bathe, don't wash as most, don't, you know, don't do this. Absolutely. We bathe people two or three times a day. You hydrate that skin up, you then put, uh, some prote you put um, an emollient on top of it. And remember, an emollient is essentially going to sit on the top of the skin. So what does that do? It stops um, per perspiration and transpiration of, of uh, so water loss from the skin. And then we put on our whatever it is, be it, you know, um, steroid, for example, or tacrolimus, and immune, both immunosuppressants. Yeah, eczema is much more likely to become infected, so, and that sort of drives the inflammatory process, so treating and reducing the amount of infection, reducing the amount of allergens that they're, you know, they're exposing themselves to, uh, all of that type of stuff. And, and early on in life now, we're sort of, we're really pushing, you know, to get kids out and get their immune system activated to things. So playing in the dirt, playing on the, like, children of farmers have less risk of, of, of eczema than children of super neurotic professional parents, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness is not necessarily a good thing when you're young because that's when your immune system is, is developing and beginning to recognize what's good and what's bad. Um, but it, it, is, it is increasing. Um, and if you think about it, we're not meant to be showering and, you know, getting wet every day isn't a problem, but it's using, using soaps and shampoos and all of those type of things and bubble baths, they strip the skin. Um, so it's, but it's not, it's, it's not curable. Um, people will look at kids and say, oh, they'll grow out of it. In fact, only about 50 or so percent, depends, will actually grow out of it. And you can get eczema at any time of your life. Are deodorants uh, containing aluminium, mm. are they dangerous? Um, we, there's no evidence to suggest that they are dangerous. For, you know, but again, how do, you, how do you say that? There's no evidence. But who's been following it for 30 or 40 or 50 years? We don't know. The aluminum is used to actually just block the pores. That's essentially what it does. It doesn't block the, the and, we, and we use very high concentrations in medical deodorants. Um, there's some suggestion, again, it was the same thing with aluminum pots and Alzheimer's. Was there, you know, was there a link there or, you know, the deodorant? So I don't know you could say yes or no to that. I'd say it would be highly unlikely, but we can never, we'll never know because no one's going to do that trial. Mm. Do they ever get vitamin D then? Well, the majority of your vitamin D does come from your, comes from your diet. Um, it does actually come from our, you know, in this part of it comes from the diet. Um, and also, you get to a certain point of vitamin D production within the skin, and then if you continue your, mal your um, radiation uh, exposure, it starts to break down the vitamin D. That's, you know, one of the things that they're, they're looking at, that they think that might be the case, because there are people who, you know, Caucasian people who live in equatorial regions who are vitamin D deficient. And you, th but you, know, you, wonder, you wonder why. Um, so the reason why we say is because children cannot really protect themselves particularly well. Um, you know, they don't, their, their, their skin is still developing, the melanocytes are not activated, they're going to burn more easily, and as a result that damage is going to be there. So it is about keeping your children out of the sun. And then the difficulty is you know, using some protection factors, which is what most people think of when they're talking about some protection factor. You don't want to be doing that on a child's skin at an early age. Though there are um, uh, the sort of the toddler-friendly sun protection factors, which just have less, in, less ingredients and are more the titanium and the zinc. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with your kids, it's, it's the usual. The amount of vitamin D or solar radiation you need is, they think, again, no definitive, but 20 minutes on the back of your hands and your face in midday sun is all you need so you don't get rickets. Um, 
Uh, but again, it, it alters. We, we, we monitor the vitamin D levels on all our melanoma patients because you, if you're vitamin D deficient and you get a second melanoma, it may be slightly uh, protective. Um, and it's amazing. The people that you think are going to, you know, they, they all, you, you just pick up vitamin D deficiency. But, you know, I've had a farmer who's out all year round and he's vitamin D deficient. So I think vitamin D, from our point of view, is mainly diet. And if you're worried, take a tablet, essentially. And get your vitamin D checked as well, which is a very simple blood test to do. But it is the wonder drug or wonder vitamin this, this decade. Yeah. You know that it's not impossible uh, to take vitamin D only diet. It's uh, you know that if you have taken diet uh, for diet mm -hmm. with diet uh, with vitamin D, mm -hmm. it's not effective in your body. Uh, it you know the metabolism I think, yeah, absolutely. from the liver, liver also kidney metabolism yeah. can be affected Not only diet, you know. It's and not only diet. Yeah. <laughs> it's not only diet, yeah. but the amount that we need from sun exposure w is sort of being overplayed. We think diet is the majority of vitamin D, but you need some solar exposure, but not an awful lot. You know, you don't need, as they say, that's why the 20 minutes. So you do need some solar, but not as much as we, would, as we think we would, would do. And I think... And I think also absorption of vitamin D differs from person to person. Um, you know, so you know, so it's 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 like you know I often say my grandmother was right. It's everything in moderation. You know, everything in moderation. It's a question over here. Was there? How important is it for each individual to to know what is the skin they're in? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Um, I suppose it's the only organ that you can actually look at yourself, um, and you can monitor yourself. Um, I often say to people, if you think of, pick your kitchen at home, all right? Um, you may not know every single plate, every single pot. You have an idea where everything is, etc. If you were going to look for something, you'd have an idea. If I broke one of your plates or took or added in a pot, you might not notice immediately, but after a couple of times looking around the place, you'd notice this was slightly different. So what's the difference is that you're familiar with your kitchen. You don't know everything in it. You don't know the fine detail, but you're familiar. That's what you need to do with your skin as well. You need to become familiar with your skin so that if something changes or alters or there's something new that is changing and altering, you pick it up. And if you pick it up, you get it checked if it's something to worry about. Um, and what that does is the vast, say, for example, with melanoma, 60% of melanomas are picked up by the patient. So it's actually the patient themselves noticing something. So the big drive is to get people to look at their skin. Because if you look at your skin, you'll pick it up early. And melanoma and a lot of skin conditions are really manageable early on. It's when things get out of control um, or the tumor is late that, you know, that, that, that can be devastating. Um, so getting to know your skin is probably the one most important thing you can do. And I often say to people, like, try and examine your skin once a month the same date as your birthday. Because you probably might actually get around to doing it two or three every two to three months, and that's actually enough. Um, but if you try and remember it once a month, and it's a really quick, check your back. If you have a partner, get them to check your back. A mirror, strip down, full length mirror, hand mirror. Don't forget to check your scalp. You do a hair dryer if you have a lot of hair. Look behind the ears, um, under the arms, uh, between the toes, on your hands and your feet, between the buttocks, on your buttocks, behind the back of your legs, all of those areas, so that you just over time gradually teach your brain what's normal for you so that if something is altered or changed, because anybody at any age of any skin type can develop a melanoma. And that's one of the things that we sort of push people to do. Mm -hmm. um, what's the reason why sometimes it doesn't go away in some people? I don't know. I think would be my, <laughs> my answer to that. I think, uh, I, you know, we have no idea why some people, you know, have, have pain and some people don't. No idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of the day. So we have a question? Yeah. Hmm, inappropriate. Well, like, um, yeah, maybe if there's someone too strong or yeah. too dark. So, like Australians. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. Or people who live in Miami who are Caucasian. Yeah, and that's the problem is that we, we have, you know, our civilization has, has, um, has changed so quickly in such a short period of time. Our 
bodies haven't been uh, able to change so fast. So you have all of these immigration into different, so we have you know, darker skinned people living in Ireland um, who are vitamin D deficient. Yeah, again, probably a combination of two things. We have, you know, Celtic people living in Australia and they're out and about in the sun, etc. So, you know, that will all change, I'm sure, in about, you know, two or three thousand years' time, if we're still flying around the place, we'll all be sort of somewhat the same colour. I think we'll have gone to a, a sort of, uh, we'll probably have gone to a, uh, the, the colour of a, of a red, Indian, red Indian or an Inuit tribes because they are able to protect themselves but yet get enough vitamin D from their diet, etc. So I think we'll probably all become sort of mute over time. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and that's pretty, pretty much the, you know, from, but from an uh, yeah, evolutionary sense, there's no particular one tribe that they, they would look at and see. One of the things you, you, know, you wonder about is, for example, um, albinism in, in Africa. Why did that occur? Why is that a selected sort of uh, gene? You know, why, why does it occur there? Because, of course, they die very early, um, and they are shunned in the vast majority. Again, why? Because they died early. They were of no use from a procreation point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you.